We have another, a number of indications that tell us that he was a very, very young uh, teenager. Uh, this story takes place the same year uh, that David was anointed king among his brothers uh, in his father's Jesse's house uh, by the prophet Samuel. We know that story uh, and how that uh, Samuel went through seven of his sons uh, and none of them were to be anointed king. And so uh, the Bible says that the Lord uh, spoke to Samuel uh, uh, and Samuel told Jesse, the Lord has not chosen any of these. Uh, are all the young men here? Uh, and he said, Jesse did. Uh, there remains yet the youngest. Uh, so all seven uh, are referred to as young men. Apparently him and his wife had them one after the other, rapid fire. David was so young among those seven, uh, he wasn't even considered uh, uh, to be a candidate. He's too young to be numbered uh, with these other young men. And then, of course, uh, in the narrative of uh, the story of David and Goliath, uh, uh, when David presents himself uh, to Saul to go out and fight Goliath, Saul said to David, uh, you're not able to go against this Philistine. Uh, you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. The word that Saul uses uh, is a word that's used throughout the Bible referring to young men and women uh, that God used. And it's a word that refers to an adolescent, one who is not fully developed uh, but on their way to being developed. They're on their way to, pro uh, to developing uh, uh, the physical and emotional uh, uh, attributes of manhood and it's usually attributed to someone uh, between the ages of 13 and 19 and then of course uh, when David actually goes out onto the battlefield uh, this adolescent uh, the Bible says that the Philistine uh, is insulted uh, uh, that this is who uh, the children of Israel have sent uh, to fight against him uh, and uh, the Bible says that he looked at David uh, and disdained him uh, for he was only a youth uh, ruddy and good-looking. Now, this is not uh, an exception. It's a pattern in the Bible of God touching, calling, challenging young teenagers uh, to be men and women of God in their own right. Joseph, the Bible takes note that at the time he's getting these prophetic dreams uh, in the book of Genesis, uh, he is 17 years old. Uh, Jeremiah refers to himself uh, when God calls him and said, Lord, uh, how can I ever do this? Uh, I am but a youth, same word uh, that is found uh, in the text uh, of this uh, uh, story of David and Goliath. Uh, we have the reference of Daniel uh, uh, and his contemporaries uh, that were solicited by Nebuchadnezzar to be trained. Uh, this was the cream of the crop uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the captives, uh, and the Bible refers to them as young uh, men. And Esther, uh, uh, Queen Esther, the woman who became uh, uh, queen during captivity, uh, is referred to uh, as a young woman over and over again. Uh, the Bible wants us to see uh, and doesn't refer to these people as just this individual uh, or Esther or Daniel or Jeremiah. It gives us their age, uh, and if it doesn't give us their age, uh, it gives us their range of age, uh, which is somewhere during their teenage years. We know that Samuel himself was called and began to prophesy as a boy. 1 Samuel 3, 1, now the boy, Samuel, ministered to the Lord before Eli. And when he was a young boy, uh, he grew up somewhat, but he's still young. So Samuel grew, the Lord was with him, and all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of the Lord. So there was a recognition that this young boy, this young man, this adolescent uh, had the spiritual capabilities to provide leadership. This was something that was recognized uh, by the nation. We have the account uh, of 
King Josiah. He was the son of a wicked king born into an atmosphere of backsliding and spiritual decline. Listen to what the scripture says. Josiah was eight when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem and he did what was right, walked in the ways of his father David. He did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left for in the eighth year of his reign, so now he's 16, while he was still young, the Bible says, he began to seek the God of his father. You know what we need? We need 16-year-olds that'll be seeking God with all of their hearts. All of Jesus' disciples were young men. I've known that, but as I'm reading the commentaries about this, uh, one said that Peter would probably have been the oldest. He was the only one married. And the rest of the 11 disciples uh, were probably between 15 and 18 years old. Still, uh, they were young men when Jesus died and rose. Uh, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, they were commissioned uh, as the church uh, of Jesus Christ, the apostles to provide leadership, uh, while most of them were probably still under 25 years old. The challenge here and the point that I want to make is I'm not just trying to inspire young people to live for God. We want you to do that. But the scriptural emphasis on youth uh, is leadership. And this is very significant. I understand, and we all do, uh, that wisdom comes with age. Uh, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. Uh, we need the insight and the wisdom uh, of those with life experience uh, to provide necessary influence uh, and leadership. But all of that uh, uh, notwithstanding, uh, God has always intended uh, young people uh, in significant to be in significant roles uh, of leadership consider Joel 2:28 uh, and it shall come to pass uh, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy uh, and your young men uh, shall see visions uh, prophecy uh, is a function of leadership you're getting a word from God uh, you are dispensing and dispersing that among the multitudes. And the idea there is that God is going to call young men and young women to dream dreams and see visions and provide reference points for others to follow. It's a function of leadership. We know what was happening when Samuel was called uh, uh, and he began his prof prophetic ministry uh, as, uh, as a young boy. Uh, we know that uh, Israel was lost. Uh, they were in moral decline. Uh, there was no lamp uh, burning in the temple. Eli was, uh, uh, was a wicked, uh, lazy, uh, carnal, uh, uh, and, and selfish uh, uh, high priest. Uh, and so God solicited a young boy, deposited anointing on him, and tend and in Intended for him to provide leadership. The problem in Israel, when David stepped out onto the battlefield that day, is a problem of leadership. Leadership is not coming from the king. Leadership is not coming uh, from military leaders as far as that battle is concerned. And so God raises up uh, the most unlikely of all to provide the necessary leadership. Uh, not trained in war, not a warrior who's skillful uh, with bow and sword, uh, but he is uh, there and he's available and he has faith. Uh, and God doesn't just want David to be a good boy, serve God, get good grades in school. Uh, he puts him in a position uh, to provide leadership for a generation that's lost. And what we have here in this expression of leadership is the younger influencing the older. Now, I want to be very careful how we take this. I'm not looking for an eight-year-old to pastor the church. But look at our culture and see what's happening. Look at what my generation and the generation that came up immediately after mine has done to our world. These are the baby boomers and the Gen X generation 
both born after World War II uh, and under our watch, under the watch of the unsaved uh, of this generation, uh, we have witnessed cultural uh, and moral rot. Uh, we've witnessed the sexual revolution, uh, no-fault divorce, feminism, uh, uh, all the elements that we see uh, deeply embedded in our culture today, uh, along with a spirit of anarchy uh, and antichrist uh, and rebellion. And so now along comes uh, a third post-war generation uh, that we call the millennials, born uh, uh, from 1980 forward uh, and I want to make a declaration uh, that you guys uh, are going to determine which way the pendulum is going to swing uh, when David showed up on the battlefield that day uh, is it going to be more of the same is he going to acquiesce uh, and surrender to the status quo uh, of nobody rising up uh, or is he going to step out uh, and repudiate the dysfunction uh, of the previous generation uh, and provide the necessary leadership uh, to turn the tide uh, it is in your hands to do so uh, and God will put upon you uh, the mantle of responsibility uh, to provide leadership for this generation I just read just this week an editorial written by a man named David uh, uh, Leinhardt and his the title uh, of his article was why teenagers uh, might grow up to be conservative and this guy's a liberal right for the New York Times and he looks back to the 1960s radicalism sexual revolution and all that Ronald Reagan was elected president in 1980 because uh, the pendulum had swung and the young people of that generation uh, that were voting for the first time uh, overwhelmingly voted for Ronald Reagan uh, and what is called the Reagan Revolution uh, was fueled uh, by those young first-time voters uh, who repudiated uh, the rebellion of the 60s uh, and said, no, we're not going to accept the status quo. Uh, we're going to take this country in another direction. It's the younger influencing the older and providing a catalyst to fix the damage. David comes onto a battlefield in the midst of a generation of people that are leaderless. They can't discern a cause to fight for. They've lost touch with the God of their fathers. And this young teenager is God's choice to be a catalyst to turn the tide uh, and he does remember when he came onto the battlefield uh, uh, the description of the scene uh, is this uh, verse 24 says and all the men of Israel uh, when they saw Goliath uh, fled from him uh, and were dreadfully afraid uh, David uh, was called think about the 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 the, the tide uh, and the culture of that uh, it was unanimous nobody's gonna fight Goliath all of us are afraid nobody's rising up uh, and along bouncing onto this uh, uh, scene comes David uh, and it is the younger uh, who is called uh, again sometimes seemingly overwhelming odds uh, to repudiate the former uh, and the older uh, and the failed generation uh, and provide leadership so I want to talk secondly about the obstacles that have to be overcome because this is not automatic. There are numerous ones that we could cite, perhaps identify. Landscape is filled with obstacles that are killing the seed in our youth. Family dysfunction, media, all kinds of things are out there uh, whose uh, design is to undermine that seed. I want to consider two of them that I think we see in our text. Two hindrances that are undermining the seed of God's fire and power and leadership being fueled in our youth. One is peer pressure. All of us probably are subject to it to one degree or another. But young people, and I want you to listen to me, young people are particularly prone to pattern their behavior in relationship to what others think. 
Young people don't want to separate from the crowd and make a stand and stand alone. That is the most horrible, offensive posture to take. And so they will acquiesce to whatever the status quo is, surrender to it so that they can be accepted. Someone wrote about this and said, peers become an important influence on behavior during adolescence. Peer pressure has been called the hallmark of an adolescent experience. Peer conformity in young people is most pronounced in respect to style, taste, appearance, ideology, and values. Peer pressure is commonly associated with episodes of adolescent risk-taking, delinquency, drug abuse, sexual behaviors, and various sorts of reckless behavior. Affiliation with friends who engage in risk behaviors has been shown to be a predicator of an adolescent's own behavior. Peer pressure can also have a positive effect when youth are pressured by their peers toward positive behavior. The importance of peers declines in the adult years. In our text, David stands up to peer pressure. That peer pressure came from the culture of leaderlessness itself, a culture embedded with fear and unbelief and doubt. Would have been very easy for him to see that, surrender to it. But he also stood up against the peer pressure uh, that flowed from his brothers when he starts uh, asking questions uh, and wondering why someone's not rising up. Eliab, his brother, uh, heard when he spoke, uh, and Eliab's anger was aroused. Uh, why did you come here? Uh, why have you left those few sheep? Uh, I know your pride and insolence. Uh, for most, uh, that's enough to get you to back down. You may know something's right, and you may pipe up, but when you're slammed or mocked or ridiculed uh, by your friends in the church uh, or your friends in life uh, or your high school mates or workmates uh, or from members of your family, uh, this is why David is such a unique man because he didn't allow himself uh, to be subjugated uh, by peer pressure. He did what was right. Is there not a cause or David's famous and familiar and infamous words. He's not moved by this pressure from his older brother, who he no doubt admires, his big brother who's in the army. Probably a lot to admire about Eliab's life. But when Eliab comes against him, he's not moved by that. He's not intimidated. He fires back. Uh, is there not a cause? The problem uh, with a lot of young people today uh, is that you have no cause uh, other than being accepted and part of the status quo. You want to be liked. You want to be accepted. You don't want to stand alone even when there's conviction working. And you know something is the right way to go. Uh, your peers constantly pull you back underneath the sway of their influence. David wasn't influenced by peer pressure. As a matter of fact, he became the peer pressure. And by the end of the day, everyone is acquiescing to the influence that he wielded. The second obstacle is when parents and kings compromise. It's very rare that a child will survive the compromise of their parents. It's very rare that a child will survive and maintain passion, fire, and zeal under the influence of parental compromise or the compromise of a king. Josiah would be an exception. He had a wicked father, but at eight years old, he had more sense, and perhaps he was influenced by his grandfather, Manasseh, who had lived a wicked life, but in the end repented. Josiah would have seen that. And there was enough of, uh, of uh, this repentance uh, and radical turnaround of Manasseh's life uh, to get the attention of young Josiah. And at eight years old, uh, like that young boy that Pastor Ruby talked about, some of these kids uh, have more sense than some adults do. 
Samuel and David had great parents, and they no doubt helped them along. But others are not so fortunate. Che children, teenagers, young men and women can get swallowed up by parental compromise. So what are we talking about? We're talking about parents who started with conversion, with zeal, with radical obedience, with faithfulness, with ministry, being in every service, on fire for God, passionate, Jesus is first, the will of God is primary, but over the years, that has eroded, and you've fallen somewhere underneath that in your life today. You're no longer driven by such. Now other things have taken priority, recreation, uh, uh, buying more expensive toys, uh, uh, no longer involved in ministry. While you're still in the church, uh, still saved, still serving God. Then, children start growing up. They're hearing the preaching. They're, they're feeling and seeing the influence uh, of what it means to be a passionate uh, and zealous believer in Jesus Christ. And God starts dealing with them, challenging them. They start exhibiting that zeal, and what happens is that it's killed. It's not encouraged. This great opportunity for David come un came underneath Saul's oversight. He saw something in David, released him ultimately uh, to go fight Goliath, uh, but ultimately because he was a compromiser, uh, he didn't know how to cultivate uh, something that was working of God in David's life. Uh, and this is what happens is that a compromiser uh, will instinctively uh, try to kill the seed, not overtly. They're not overtly trying to destroy uh, uh, faith uh, or passion or zeal, but there's something in the heart of someone uh, who's fallen from here to here uh, when they see their children rising up uh, or a David rising up uh, by their conduct, by their behavior, uh, by how they handle that, uh, they end up killing and discouraging that godly seed. And this makes it very hard for young people and they rarely will survive and maintain being on fire and being a radical for Jesus when the parents aren't. Lesser men than David would have succumbed to the peer pressure that flowed from Eliab. And if they had survived that, they probably would have capitulated under the weight of Saul's assault against them. These are the compromisers. We're not encouraging the seed. Someone said that generally children will pray, evangelize, witness, be faithful at the same level the parents do. And when they try to respond to a level beyond that, God moves on them they're not encouraged, they're not helped, and many times in these young people, uh, the conviction that they felt will begin to fade uh, just like it has in you. This quote is called, When Parents Compromise. I have seen that a father's compromise becomes the son's commitment that the high point of a child's spiritual pursuit is referenced by the lowest level that the parents have shown acceptable. Now we're not talking about parents that have gone on drugs, uh, abandoned their children and gone off. We're talking about ones that are in the church and you're good people and you love your children. They're going to rise so far, and when they hit the level that you're at, they don't want to repudiate you. They love you. They care about you. They think highly of you. 
And generally, it's not an absolute statement, uh, but generally they'll not rise above that. Therefore, uh, the highest level of commitment these children rise to uh, will be the level to which the parents have fallen to in their compromise. It's not an intentional wanting to kill a seed, but that's exactly what happens when kings and parents compromise. Let's talk about the challenge that we need to respond to. Who will lead? Who among the, other, the under 25-year-olds here today? Let's just draw a line at 25. From 12, 13, 14, who among you, who will allow the Holy Ghost to get a hold of your life? Once and for all, in order for you to provide leadership, some things have to be left behind. And this is a perfect altar for you to do that very thing this morning. Radical decisions, reference points, services uh, that provide for us uh, opportunity to shift and go in another direction in our lives. Uh, this, what, this is what uh, the battlefield was like for David. It was a great big altar call for him. Am I going to respond? Am I going to exhibit faith? Am I going to obey God? Am I going to believe God? Am I going to accept the challenge? You have to make choices in your life. Hard choices. It's one thing to decide I'm not fornicating, not smoking, not doing drugs, not running away from home. But it's another thing to make choices about things that you don't, you can't, and you shouldn't do that aren't bad in themselves. There comes a time every young person has to make a decision. I'm no longer going to allow my peers to determine my course. I'm coming underneath the authority of my God who's called me. You have to grow up. You have to make choices. And those choices are made in atmospheres just like this. David became more of a man. He was already a young man. But he became more of a man on that day. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke, understood, and thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There comes a time, a distinct moment in life, We've got to make that decision that is going to shift everything about how you're living, who your relationships are going to be, who and what you're going to respond to in life and listen to. You've been listening too long to the altar calls that your unsaved and carnal friends have been making. They make appeals. They have altars too, you know. And we make decisions at those altars. After David slays Goliath, Saul said, Whose son are you, young man? David answered, I'm the son of your servant. Jesse, Saul took him that day and would not let him go home to his father's house anymore. When he woke up that morning, he had no idea. His father sent him with food, said, Go see your brothers. Talk to them, give them the food, give this to their captain, and then come back home. That's what he said. Bring me a report. Problem is that God met him on the way. He heard a sermon, accepted a challenge. And the king said, you're not going home anymore, son. It's time to grow up. It's time to put on the new and put off the old. Where did we get the idea that it's okay to waste your teenage years? Who put that in your head and who put that in the head of the parents? We excuse frivolous, destructive behavior. Oh, well, they're just young. Yeah, they stole a car, got drunk, uh, total live. Oh, they're just kids. Where did we get the idea that youth is for that and it's okay? 
It's okay to spend your youth, teenage years uh, playing video games. It's okay to ignore every sermon preached while you're texting and playing on your phone. You're young. Greatness is ascribed to those who get serious early in life. You want to be a 35-year-old layabout? Just keep going the direction you're going. You want to make something of your life? Then start getting serious. One of the founding fathers, and I could give you scores of examples of this, Ben Franklin, embodied the norm in his day. At the age of 12, he became a printer's apprentice and held that position until he was in his 20s. This set something in motion in his life. And the greatness that he became was purchased by getting serious and getting his bearings and getting on an adult track early in life. I read Chernow, or I'm in the middle of reading Chernow's biography of George Washington when he was president. A lot of life, a lot of water under the bridge by this time. He's learned a lot. He was conversing with his nephew, who was a teenager about to enter university, and he said, every hour misspent in your youth is lost forever, and the future years cannot compensate for the lost days at this period of your life. Now, I understand the sentiment, wasted years can be repurchased, it's just harder to do so. Lost opportunity can be laid hold of again, but isn't it better to take possession of the opportunity that God presents to you in the now? So here's the catalyst. And it's nothing more complicated than this. Perhaps David's capabilities while he's a young 14 to 19 year old teenager Perhaps they were in place because he had a serious relationship with God. You can sit in one of our churches, go through your teenage years, never even get saved. Never even get serious about your relationship with God. Remember when David is having his audience with King Saul. His reference points in life are spiritual. He didn't say, oh, no, Saul, I can take this giant because I saw the movie the other day and, and, and the guy had a bigger gun than the other guy and it was all great, so just give me one of those guns. I can do it. No, his reference point were not what he saw in the media. They were what he experienced in his relationship with God because he had a serious and a real one. He presents his credentials to King Saul. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. His testimony, by the time he got to that battlefield as this young teenager, his testimony is already in place. He already has a spiritual track record of faith and victory. And this conquest in his mind is something that is something that he can accomplish because he has a track record. He's living a lifestyle of spiritual reference points, trusting God, a lifestyle of faith. And then when he gets out onto the battlefield, more of this is brought to the table. David said to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand. Maybe this is where all this should begin. By you answering an altar call and making a decision, I'm getting serious in my relationship with God. You could be 12 or 13 years old and have a serious relationship with God. Josiah had some semblance of that. And by the time he was 16, he's still referred to as a young man, but he's getting a hold of God at that age. And it became the, uh, uh, the, the direction of his life. Now we come to verse 54. David is contending for victory. 
metaphorically, he's facing a yet unachieved challenge and conquest. Goliath is still alive, still waving his sword and mocking the people of God, still formidable. Metaphorically, he drags into Saul's tent the carcass of a lion and a bear. Saul says, you can't take this man. You're a boy. He said, well, here's what I have done. I know this bear and this lion are not him, but I've taken them out. And David took the head of the Philistine then and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. Listen to me very carefully. The actions that you take now set in motion the dynamics for future conquest. He killed a lion and a bear. He doesn't know anything about Goliath, but he killed a lion and a bear in a fit of faith, protecting the sheep, trusting God for the strength to do so. It was all a spiritual exercise. So by the time he comes onto the battlefield, this is already in him. He doesn't have to work it out. He doesn't have to figure it out. He doesn't enter onto the battlefield having to be delivered uh, from fear uh, that had gripped everybody else. Uh, these are already his credentials. Uh, and he drags these carcasses uh, into Saul's tent uh, and says, I took them out uh, and I am serving notice uh, by virtue uh, of their carcasses uh, that I'm going after that giant, uh, a greater conquest, uh, a greater challenge, uh, something I've never achieved, uh, but I am delivering these carcasses uh, as a statement. Uh, Goliath, I am coming after you. And then he takes the head of Goliath. And this is the curious thing, and this is what Pastor Ruby and I were talking about. He took the head of Goliath, and he took it to Jerusalem, put it there. And I say, so what? Well, the so what is that as it as of that moment, Jerusalem had not been conquered yet. Jerusalem at that time was an ancient city. It's mentioned uh, in Genesis. It's occupied uh, by the mortal enemies of Israel, the Jebusites, who were a, a faction of the Canaanites. Jerusalem survived. Joshua's conquering of the promised land. They survived uh, the 400 years uh, of uh, the book of Judges. But somehow instinctively, I don't know if Pastor Ruby's figured this out, but somehow instinctively David understood uh, Jerusalem matters, uh, Jerusalem's important, uh, Jerusalem is a conquest yet, a conquest uh, yet unachieved, uh, Jerusalem has to be taken uh, in order for God's uh, prophecies to be for Somehow this young boy had, had some understanding of this, uh, he sees it, uh, the lion, the bear, their carcasses are there, uh, I've got now the head of Goliath, uh, and now I'm going after Jerusalem, uh, he marches into enemy territory uh, and deposits the head of Goliath uh, on the doorstep of Jerusalem, uh, and he serves notice uh, I don't know when I don't know how uh, but one day I'm coming after you and he did uh, in 2nd Samuel chapter 5 uh, years later uh, after David is king uh, he gets a great conquest over Jerusalem uh, drives out the Canaanites and the Jebusites uh, and it became the city of God you have now I want you to think about this None of us have arrived, certainly teenagers haven't. There are areas of conquest achieved thus far. You're here at conference. You're saved. You may be filled with the Holy Ghost. There's a few carcasses of former things that you've overcome, but you've got a long way to go. Can we say amen? But you know what you can do this morning? Uh, bring the head of Goliath to this altar uh, and say, whatever it is in my life uh, that is hindering uh, and undermining, uh, I don't know how, I don't know when, uh, but I'm coming after it. And I'm bringing the conquest uh, of past victory to this altar. We don't fully appreciate, possibly, even as kings and parents and leaders, 
the unbelievable resource. God recognizes the resource. And over and over and over and over and over again in the Bible, he reaches down to that resource of young men and women just like you. You get on fire and this world is changing. You get on fire, get stirred up at this altar, make some decisions to change the course of your life and mark it down. Our world is going to undergo a fundamental radical transformation if our young men and women will get on fire for God. If parents can answer this altar call and perhaps some leaders and say no more compromise. I'm setting the example for my children. I'm going to be on fire. I'm going to get back to where I once was. I may have left my first love but there would probably be nothing probably be nothing better uh, than for teenagers to see mom and dad uh, at this altar uh, weeping and broken before God. I think we're in for a worldwide, uh, earth-shaking, uh, revolutionary revival, uh, and it could start, a lot of it could start uh, right here at this altar. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads, every head bowed, every eye closed.